looking after the assets of a business for owners, for example, shareholders, surely you owe it to them to take a longer and more sensible term view about the direction of the company rather than a short knee-jerk reaction, including worrying about silly things like a daily share price. So, so I, IRO or can, can help, you know, um, CEO think in the long term rather than short term and can control the, the, the long term of, of the company growth, right? That is what you're saying? I am, because if you think who talks to analysts, who talks to investors every day, I certainly did when I was an IRO. How often did my CEO speak to analysts once a quarter? Funnily enough, we have quarterly reporting in Singapore. Um, how often did the CFO, my other reporting line, chief financial officer, speak to investors? Probably on a monthly basis. How often did my chairman and the board get to sit in front of investors once a year? That's an in interesting set of, um, set of uh, aspects of, of, of governance because in the UK, again, um, don't let me bore you with the UK, but I think thinking about it and where I was sitting before, it makes a lot of sense. We've just been part of a big public consultation exercise which looked at stewardship. We had something called the Stewardship Code in 2010, but nobody really understood what stewardship meant, as I just mentioned. Is it the managers looking after the assets of the business? Is it the board providing oversight in terms of direction on behalf of shareholders? Or frankly, um, as the company started to say, hang on, it's the investors. They're stewards of other people's money. They should be asking the right questions. They should be engaging properly. And they should stop worrying about quarterly reporting or external events or short-term share prices. So, you know, I mean, it's both, isn't it? Stewardship is actually different aspects of the same thing looking at a business from different points of view for the same purpose, which is ensuring the long-term success um, of, of the company. What happened with the stewardship code was people argued forever on whose fault it was, particularly regarding the banks. Was it the CEOs, the overpaid CEOs? Um, was it the boards who were so, so submissive, kept paying out, kept paying out, kept agreeing to all the mergers and acquisitions until eventually the whole thing fell for that? Well, hang on, where the shareholders, where were they? Where were they with the questions? Where were they with providing some sort of um, check? So, in the end, the stewardship code resulted in a working party. The working party presented its findings, um, and then the working party concluded that actually the most useful thing to do would be to come up with guidance, guidance for the practitioners. So this is where the IR society came in because the problem with all these big public consultations, these big working party groups, these big names attached to all these reviews is that from a day-to-day -day basis, actually you guys sitting in this room, guys who do the job day-to-day, -day, know most of it's happening anyway. If you're talking to analysts, if you're talking to investors every day, you're the linchpin for that communication. You're actually the person that provides that continuity, that credibility or not, and you're the person that provides that access to who should be in the meeting. And what was interesting about the guidance we produced, which has literally just come out, and I was mentioning to uh, Surafong earlier that it, there's, a, there's a link on our website um, for, for this guidance. In the end, we just came up with good old, down-to-earth, practical aspects of how to run a meeting, including an agenda, who should be in the meeting, knowing who's in the meeting. You'll know, for example, when you go in to meet a fund manager, sometimes you're not quite sure whether he's the decision maker. He might be the manager of the assets, but he might be managing them on behalf of somebody else. You'll know from your share register, you can't always know who the beneficial owner is or who's making the decision. So there's actually a long chain. And so we got to the conclusion, very practical, that actually you shouldn't even be in meetings unless you know who you're talking to. I know that sounds ridiculous, and I can see Richard thinking, well, hang on, I've been having meetings for decades, Richard, or almost decades, and of course he knows who's in the meeting. But it's interesting because often you think, oh, Fidelity Capital, delighted to have the meeting, quickly wheel in the CEO or the Chief Financial Officer. And actually, if I put my hand on my heart, 
often there's been about six to eight people in the meeting, and I haven't had a clue who all of them are and what precisely the role is, or whether actually they're making the decision to buy, sell, hold, or refer to somebody else. And one of the issues that came out of the public consultation in the UK is often people forget that the investor side, the fund management industry, is also going through change and turmoil. The industry is consolidating, it's become very competitive, the resources are shrinking because like everybody they're supposed to generate a decent rate of return for whoever's investing in their funds. So what they've started doing over the last few years in the UK and in the US is outsourcing part of the decision making. Can you imagine that? How can you be a steward of an asset if you're getting somebody else to do the job? So what our guidance concluded was that there are a lot of issues with the fund management side, the way it's structured and the way it deals with investor relations. So one of the keys for the investor relations officer, I know it sounds obvious, is to manage those meetings in terms of participants and really understanding who's actually in the meeting. Is it the fund manager, he's just running the money? Is it the asset owner, perhaps the beneficial owner, who could be making the decisions? Um, is it the corporate governance people? You'll know increasingly, including in Southeast Asia, we're meeting more corporate governance people from Aberdeen, Fidelity. So ask yourself, you know, what are they doing in the meeting? They're just ensuring that you're complying with whatever their view of corporate governance is. How the board's structured, how the company's run, who's who, is it clear who's accountable, who's responsible from management all the way to the board. So they're not actually the asset owner, and they're certainly not the decision maker in most cases. Sometimes they have an influence, and sometimes when the decision is outsourced, for example, to a proxy advisor, if you come across ISS, um, some of the other solicitation companies who are there to look at, for example, voting patterns when you get to AGM. Well, often the fund management firms that are short of resources are farming out the role to a proxy advisor to look with the governance people at whether or not you're complying with their particular view of governance. And then they're making the decisions on your resolutions. So your board, your management goes to the AGM suddenly realizes that they're getting a lot of votes against them. And often the issue's been the IRO, certainly in the UK, hasn't known who was making the decision. Worse, there's no transparency. You're talking to one person who says, I'm making the decision. Decisions, in fact, being made by somebody else. So as a society, we made a very strong representation to the government. We made a strong representation to the investment community and said, you have to be more transparent on your side. If you're expecting us to manage the relationship for the benefit of you in the long term, we need to know who we're talking to. So I'll make sure that um, your colleagues at SET know where that link is. And I might even have a copy of that um, guidance, which I'll leave, uh, leave with the SET, and hopefully give you access to it on, on the IR Society website. Because in the end, we got through all the consultations, we got through all the working party groups, and we just came up with good IR advice for companies. And what was most important about the conclusion of this guidance, which I helped launch um, a week or so ago in London, was that we made sure everybody in the audience, the who's who in, in the UK financial sector at this um, launch, understood that actually IR is your answer. The IR officer is the guy living and breathing the relationship every day. He's the guy that's the first port of call. He's the guy that will direct the access to CFO, CEO, even in the UK now, non-executive director. You, you probably have the notion of independent directors. Someone who's supposed to act on behalf of shareholders and sometimes might be valuable in a meeting. So if you've got the corporate governance guys from Fidelity coming, there's no point, frankly, having the chief financial officer. Excuse me if you're a chief financial officer. May not even be any point in having the CEO, excuse me if you're a CEO, because actually the governance issue should be addressed by somebody over and above, right? If you tell me as the CEO about governance at the IR society, I'm going to tell you everything's fine. It's the best run society in the world. We've got the best team in the world. We have the best committee structure in the world. We have the best board in the world, right? But that's coming from me, because I'm responsible for it. Which CEO wouldn't say that, right? We're all proud 
And we are all doing a good job by and large. But the whole point of governance is checks and balances. Just as the exchange would know, the whole point of rules and regulations is to make sure you've got an idea of what you should be doing. And when it goes wrong, that something can be done about it. If nothing's done about it, you get the case of Royal Bank of Scotland going bankrupt, being bailed out by the British taxpayer, including myself now, unfortunately, as a UK taxpayer. And a very sorry story. So what we concluded was IR is front and centre, and IR should really be given greater profile, greater recognition, and of course that's the job of the society. But it's also the job of every worthwhile CEO or whatever reporting line you have. Um, Sarah, I don't know if that was an answer to the question 15 minutes ago, but what I will do is, if I can go off into issues and trends, I will do that, and I'll continue to skip through the um, slides. ไปเร็วไปไหมครับไม่เร็วนะเดี๋ยวขอขอสรุปตะกี้นิดหนึ่งเพราะตะกี้มันมันค่อนข้างยาวเลยเดี๋ยวมีการสรุปเฉพาะอีกท่านมันจะเป็นผมผมเข้าใจว่าสิ่งสิ่งสิ่งที่เขามันจะพูดเพราะว่าตอนนี้เทรนด์มันเริ่มมันเริ่มเปลี่ยนไปแล้วเพราะตอนนี้มันมีตั้งแต่ฟันเมเจอร์คนที่ทำฟันกัฟเวเนสคนมันมันมันมีหลายเลเวลแล้วคือเนื่องจากว่ามันมีปัญหาที่ยุโรปเนี่ยมันทําให้เอ่อฟันในยุโรปหรือว่าฟันในยุโรปหรือหรือในอเมริกาเนี่ยเริ่มดาวไซซิ่งคนทํางานมากขึ้นเพราะฉะนั้นเขาเอาสอดสิ่งที่เขาไม่ว่าจะเป็นคนที่จะมาหาดีลคนที่มาคุยกับทุนเพราะฉะนั้นสิ่งที่ทาง IRO เนี่ยต้องต้องทําก็คือว่าต้องต้องไอดีนิฟายก่อนว่าใครที่จะมาคุยกับเรานะครับแล้วก็ข้อข้อมูลอะไรที่เขาต้องการแล้วก็ต้องเอาคนไปคุยกับเขาที่ถูกคนนะครับบางทีเนี่ยบางทีเขาตะกี้เขาพูดคําว่าเป็นมาจากฟิเดลิตี้แต่มันเขาอาจจะไม่ใช่ฟันเมเจอร์ก็ได้เขาอาจจะเป็นคน,คนที่ดูแลทางด้านการเงินคนที่ดูแลทางด้านอื่นๆเนี่ยเพราะฉะนั้นเราต้องเพราะฉะนั้นถ้าคนที่ดูทางด้านการเงินเนี่ยก็ไม่ต้องเอาอีกซีอหรือซีเข้ามามันก็ต้องเป็นคนอื่นที่ดูแลทางด้านนี้เข้าไปเพื่อที่จะคุยเพื่อที่ทําความเข้าใจกับฟันนั้นๆนะครับไม่งั้นเนี่ยพอเราไม่เข้าใจว่าใครที่จะมาคุยกับเรานะครับแล้วก็เราเอาซีอไปคุยเนี่ยมันก็ไม่ถูกคนแหละเราก็ไม่สามารถอธิบายได้ใช่ไหมครับเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยเราต้องทําความเข้าใจว่าใครเข้ามาคุยกับเราหลายๆครั้งผมเรียนอย่างนี้แล้วกันประสบการณ์ที่เคยเจอคือว่าฟันต่างประเทศเนี่ยมามาจ้างเราในการที่จะไป identify บริษัทที่จะมา invest เพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยผมไม่ผมไม่ใช่เจ้าของเงินหรอกผมเป็นคนที่ต้องฟังและฟังจากท่านแล้วไปอธิบายกับเขาอีกทีนึงเพราะฉะนั้นท่านก็ต้องมีข้อมูลอะไรที่ที่เตรียมให้กับผมเพื่อที่ไปไปคุยกับคนนึงต่อนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยมันมันมันมันมันก็เลยเราเราต้อง identify เขาเรียกว่าต้องรู้ก่อนว่ารู้เขารู้เราว่าใครจะมาคุยกับเรานะครับเขาต้องการอะไรจากเราแล้วเราจะให้ใครไปคุยกับเขาเท่านั้นเอง Thanks a lot if, if I tend to keep going which I do by nature I like talking and you begin to think this guy is not making any sense or what he s a y obviously stop me um, thank you Kunsaret I didn't understand everything he said but I certainly got the tone of the gesture which is very helpful okay. I'm just going to rattle through these because I'm not here to teach you about valuation. I mean, this is very much back down to um, what I've been saying about this effective two-way dialogue. Another interesting aspect that came out of the um, consultation, which resulted in our guidance produced by the IR Society, along with a long list of other great parties in in the UK, is how do you know whether you're actually working effectively? And a very controversial element of the guidance is providing two-way feedback. You know, often as a company, you get the broker to provide you feedback on the investor meetings. Obviously, the broker wants to make sure that you work with him again. So generally, the feedback's quite good, isn't it? Um, and, and that's a bit of an issue because, again, in the UK, the broker industry is consolidating. The broker industry is under a lot of stress and pressure. The broker industry, like the fund management industry, is lacking in resources, and certainly most of them are affiliated to banks. And I've already mentioned the banks have had problems, so they're really up against meeting financial returns. So they're desperately cutting costs, with the result that actually in the UK we're even questioning the role of brokers as intermediaries. Of course, if you're a broker, brokers will always have a role. And frankly, good brokers will always have a role. You'll know this notion of corporate access. 
giving access to the investment community to senior people in the company. Of course, it's the role of the IR officer to determine that. And you know often brokers come up with their list of investors and you don't know whether they're shareholders, you don't know whether they're really good investors or hedge funds, short-term speculative funds. But frankly, you do need to work with some intermediaries because some intermediaries are very good, including, including brokers. So at the end of the day, you've got to find ways to make sure that you are responsible for organizing the meetings to get the best effect, whether with a broker or whether, whether yourself. And one of the issues the IR community made in this consultation was, hang on, we should also be giving feedback on the investor. If you go into a meeting and you've got somebody you shouldn't be meeting, if you go into a meeting and frankly he isn't well prepared and he asks you all the obvious questions that he should have checked on the website or looked at in the annual report or read in the research report, he's wasting your and management's time. So we felt importantly um, as IR practitioners that actually it shouldn't be one way. The feedback should be two way. So there's a controversial element in the guidance that basically says companies should be giving feedback on the investor meetings as well. And there's a, a template on how to do that. It's not particularly controversial in our view because all it's saying is, was the right person in the meeting? Did they ask the right questions? And was it worth management's while? Because the worst thing for you as an IRO is to take your boss into a meeting and you realize, gosh, this is a complete waste of time. The person hasn't got a clue who we are. They certainly don't know what we do. And they're asking all the most simple questions that I could have answered instead of my boss. Boss is upset, saying, you know, why do you waste his time? You know, IR is, is, is not doing its job. So we felt that if it's a genuine two-way dialogue, which it should be, because obviously we're taking feedback from the investor, putting it back into the management, putting it back to the board, it should be done both ways. So there's even a, a template on how to provide the feedback. And ultimately, I mean, our, our point is, if you're thinking of the long-term relationship, it has to be both ways, and it has to be constructive. And Sir John Egan, who was our bigwig who headed up the um, working party who did the guidance, basically said it comes down to relationship building, and relationships are only built on trust. And again, who's the person who's building the relationship? It's you guys, right? Because you do it every day. You don't do it once a quarter when you have results. You don't do it at the AGM. You do it every day. So again, we're able to put up center the investor relations officer. Cover that really. I'll tell you what one sad thing about the fallout in the broken community is a lot of the smaller players, the specialists, the boutique houses, have struggled to make money, so they're cutting back. And that can be a loss, because I said, you know, clearly some intermediaries are very, very good at what they do. But certainly in the UK, the industry's gone through such a tough time post-crisis that there's been a lot of adverse fallout, including losing a lot of the specialist IR providers. I'll skip through. This is very much what I've been talking about. You're the linchpin between investors and uh, your management. I don't know how many of you actually report to the board. Any of the senior IROs here report to their board of directors as opposed to management on a regular basis? It's interesting because um, certainly in Singapore, we were one of the earlier companies um, to have access to our board of directors on a regular basis. The thinking being, as I said earlier, if you ask the CEO, naturally the CEO will say what CEOs are paid to say, right? They're obviously there to give the best possible um, picture because they're running the show. We had a very canny chairman, very, very well-known chairman, who said, if we're doing the corporate governance properly, shouldn't we be getting a more independent party, um, somebody who's interfacing with the investment community more regularly to tell us what's really happening? And we did it in two ways. We started undertaking perception studies, uh, which were commissioned independently. So we went to a third party and asked them to go and ask our shareholders, go and ask the key analysts how the company was doing, how the CEO was doing, how the board was doing, how investor relations was doing, what was coming across and whether it made sense. Was it clear? Was it consistent? 
Was there no bullshit? Were we actually doing, doing what we were supposed to be doing? And this is a pretty scary thing to do the first time. The first time we did it, obviously we held our breath, <laughs> wondering what's going to be said, because what was produced was a 80-page verbatim report, meaning quotations from all the shareholders that were interviewed or asked questions and the analysts. So, for example, it could say which one of the responses did say. The trouble with John Golliver is you can never get him on the phone. So what's the point of having an IR function if there's never anybody to talk to? That came out of the first, first report. I managed to use that to increase the size of my team because obviously I can't talk to everyone all the time. So it's interesting, but it was a little, little tough. As we evolved and responded to some of the feedback and got better, obviously it became easier to deal with. But what was important, this feedback verbatim meaning as it was said, went back to the board. And from that point, which was 2003, we were expected to report to the board on a six-monthly basis. Annual perception study on the company, the executives, and IR every year. And then on results every six months and the reaction from the investment community on the results. So by the time I left SGX, the IR officer was expected to personally appear at the board meeting on a six-monthly basis and feed back what the investment community was saying. Few issues here, few issues there, generally okay, these things went down well, these were misunderstood, these didn't go down well. You may remember that SGX bid for the Australian Securities Exchange 2011, um, pretty controversial, horribly high price to pay, um, meaning, meaning in terms of financial uh, valuation, and frankly, high price to pay in terms of, I mean, I can say it now, can't I, because I'm not there, how not to do, how not to do an acquisition, because frankly, we screwed it up big time. From the moment we started to the moment it ended six months later, nothing seemed to quite go right. And to be honest, and this is again me speaking as, as a huge fan and supporter of the SGX and also as a former employee, we never quite got the communication right. And it was written up in the media, written up in analyst reports. The communications function didn't quite fire on all cylinders. IR, the media team, corporate communications, office of the CEO, etc., etc. So it was a very good case study, and one day I can share that with you perhaps, and one day perhaps we can have a, have a drink and tell you exactly how it did or, or didn't work. But it was very, very instructive, um, because frankly, if we'd had in place, I think he, an even better two-way feedback mechanism between um, all the key players and ourselves, things might have worked a bit better. We failed, and we were seen to fail miserably. And I say it's instructive because this whole notion of two-way feedback should be ingrained in your organization and should be open, transparent, and you shouldn't be afraid to actually say what's going on. From the moment we started, we were going down a slippery slope and it wasn't um, easily communicated. And clearly it wasn't communicated because we didn't, we didn't um, adjust or we weren't able to rescue the situation. So our bid failed, um, as you all know. Um, but the point of good investor relations is one day you may need it. One day you may need to go to the shareholders and explain, look, this is why we're paying a fortune for the Australian securities market. This is why you need to help us to publicly get behind the deal. We were completely misfiring. We were completely at odds with many constituents internally and externally. So it's a great case study, which, as I said, is, is perhaps for another time. Hey John, uh, you, you said that uh, perception of feedback survey from uh, analysts and fund managers is important. But how to make it right? How, how, how do you do it right? Because I know that a lot of IRO in Thailand has you know, been talking and discussing with uh, analysts and fund managers on a daily basis. Right? And, but many times they, they can't really have the proper or structured feedback for their board of directors or their CEO, do you have any recommendation? On yeah, I think that's, right? that's the problem. I mean, you asked me, head of IR, oh, we're doing brilliantly, um, share price is okay. I know you shouldn't talk about the share price, but everybody does. Um, generally, what you're saying, your media releases, every aspect, it seems, seems fine, right? 
Um, so what we felt was you needed to independently commission a study, it doesn't have to be more than annual, after the full year results, 